recently I had a day where I did not need to be at the outpost and really had no projects or errands around the house that needed to be done. And so my beautiful wife, Kelly said, Alan, you have a whole day just to pursue joy. What would you like to do today that would really be fun, that would restore your soul, that would bring you life? Well, that's a great invitation, right? But all I could do was just look at her and say, I have no idea. What I realized was I had been running so hard and so fast for so long that play had become a forgotten category in my life. And when I had the opportunity to spend a day doing that, I didn't really know how to answer that question. This is Alan Arnold, and you're listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. After a seven-part series on spiritual warfare, which if you haven't heard, I encourage you to do after this podcast, but for those who have been through the seven parts of the series, we wanted to bring you a podcast today that was fun and full of joy and hopefully that will make you both laugh and think about what are the things in your life that you love doing purely for fun? And how often do you actually get to experience that joy? That's the topic that John, Sam, Blaine, and I discuss in this podcast from 2017. We go into the importance of making time for play in our lives. So we hope you enjoy this podcast. It's called The Serious Business of Play. 6-3. 6 3 Now. <laughs> you are, you are, hang on, you are at the Ransom Heart Podcast. <laughs> John Eldridge here with Alan Arnold and two of my sons, Sam and Blaine. And that is this morning's joy. That is a live recording of a fierce game of spike ball that we were playing before we came into the studio this morning to get warmed up for a conversation about play. And so Alan was the one to suggest this a couple of weeks ago. We need to have a a conversation about play. And I immediately thought of the spike ball game, Sam, that you brought into our world and has actually become like this staff favorite. When there is a break, when there is a lunch after a tough meeting. Most days now, you can find four Ransom Heart staff members out in the parking lot and back playing spike ball. I I knew we were in business when Brad started bringing in his running shoes to play. And so when the VP is (laughs) gearing up for your casual games of spike ball. Oh, and his special yellow hat. Oh, hey, we had matching hats there for a while. (laughs) The sun gets in your eyes. It's a competitive game. That has brought so much Joy, and just for point of clarification, what is spike ball? How do you explain this to people? It's kind of like volleyball played on a trampoline. Yep, you know. I imagine people jumping on the trampoline (laughs) and lobbing the ball at each other. That audio made it sound like spike ball is played with like shooting bow and arrows at each other. Which it kind of is sometimes. Then you wonder just what Alan did to deserve. Well, that that was our game winning point, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Uh, We did so good, Alan. Yeah, no, spike ball that has a little small trampoline-like net, and you hit it down, and the other team has a certain amount of hits between them to get the ball back to the net. And it's really meant to be played on a beach where you can dive and put your knee into the ground and commit to things, but we make our parking lot in the back do what it can. It's such a simple thing, but it's brought yeah. it's brought so much joy. And as I was driving in this morning, I was thinking about the world. We're becoming more and more aware of its toxic effects, the famous, you know, unholy trinity that we are warned about over and over again is the world, the flesh, the devil. I think we're pretty clear on what the enemy's up to. I think we're pretty clear on how we self-sabotage. But the world thing is really vague. That's that's fuzzy. Like, what's that? You know, church used to grasp at it with drinking and dancing and smoking, and but that didn't seem to really change much of anything, and except for, to make people closet drinkers and smokers and dancers, but the world's effect today, 
one of the things the world really, I, I just think the bottom line thing is numb you. Yeah, totally. I, I just think that stay in technology, stay super busy. You're always just a tad behind everything. You're not caught up on email. You're not caught up on projects. And just even with your own friendships and family and phone calls and stuff. I mean, I'm realizing that I haven't talked to one of my closest friends in like four months. It, and that's just, that's just the world. It's just keep you busy and numb you. And here's the example, the effect of the world it's just stealing joy. So, Blaine, you and Emily met climbing, right? Yes. Met in a climbing gym. Thought she was pretty cute. She was an instructor there. Yeah. We actually knew each other from school, but actually... I just thought she could get me in, in climbing because I knew that as an instructor, I could climb for free if I climbed with her. Okay, so. but, but as the story goes along, kind of the day when things shifted, you guys were on a climb together. Yeah, and we would climb before work at like five out of this place. And it was one such morning when I said the complicated things men say when they're bearing their hearts to certain women. So, yeah. We were at Deep Creek for our Spokane fans. And you were out climbing Joy. When is the last time recently that you and Em have climbed? Man, we have not climbed in over a year, probably. We climbed when Emily was pregnant with Ailish, but Ailish is a year old now, so. Right? I mean, just something that was a source of joy and relationship and play. Totally. Sam? You and Suze, one of the first things that you guys did together was sailing, right? Mm -hmm. And you went out and got your sailing certification in a little, what are those, sun cats or Hobie yeah, suns? The, yeah, or, yeah, these tiny little boats. Yeah, and you sailed, loved it, mm -hmm. brought a ton of joy. Mm -hmm. When's the last time you guys were sailing? Well, we haven't lived by the ocean in quite a while. <laughs> so it's been, it's honestly been since we lived in California, which is over five years now. We're talking years. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, just to point out the conversation about play is not because this is what we do all the time. Rather, the observation is the world robs it and steals it. And one way or another, you just get busy, you get tired, you, you can't afford to do the things you used to do, can't buy the lift ticket, you can't, whatever it is. And we just wanted to bring play back to the table and talk about it. Maybe offer a little encouragement to get it back in your lives. Yeah, well, it, it almost seems at this point in our life, not wasteful in the sense that it's not good, but it's almost like we can play if time permits. And rarely does time permit in the midst of taking kids to activities, getting things done, taking care of business. And so Kelly and I were just talking about this actually a few days ago, beginning of this week, because the issue was we had just returned from a Captivating. And I was at Captivating. Of course, it's a women's event, but a couple of guys on our team are there. And so it's Monday morning, and I'm not going into the outpost, but we're sitting at our kitchen table, and I've got stacks of paper and work going on. And Kelly said, I, th I thought you were taking care of your heart today. Like I thought you were just going to enjoy and play. And I found my response, real. I was really irritated. Not so much at her, but irritated at that question mm. or that observation because I realized, I thought my response was, yeah, that'd be great if only there was time, but there's no time to recharge. I've got to get things done. I've been gone for five days. And it was a beautiful conversation where she went after my heart on, no, we're not going to do that. You're going to unplug because not only is it good for you when you play and restore, but it's good for our whole family. That The man you need to be requires play and downtime and restoration, not just doing more, doing more, doing more. I would just identify when it feels like most of your life is triage. What can get done? What do you have time for? And that the odd category of play, I'm even realizing in this conversation that most of the things I do have like a clear strategic place in my time whether it's time with God, time with community, time in my work. But play is this bonus that 
it doesn't seem to fit into the life of my soul. And therefore, it's just totally easy to go, oh, well, I was going to do X. I mean, the other one, Sam and I love the sport of triathlon and we love riding bikes and we're only now after like a three month break. It's been longer. It's already it's been four it's now. It's like a four month break, kind of harassing one another back into riding our bikes again. And it's something that was just this kind of wellspring of joy in our lives gets snatched away because there are so many important things that are just competing for its place. When you guys were riding last spring, I remember how much life it was giving. And that life was spilling over into the rest of life, you know, into work, into relationships. It was brought a, brought a lot of joy. And then, whoosh. Okay, so what I'm struck by is the language we use around, like, is very different. We're saying the word play. And when I think of my daily life, having a young daughter, Alan, like, kind of your list of just the pace of things, if I'm given a moment, I kind of feel like I have to like medicate or or relax or just kind of turn all of the valves off. And that's not the same thing as play. It's often like I'll sit down and I'll watch a video on the computer or eat some chocolate or something like that. And it's a way of kind of that mm. sighing internally, which is super different than this conversation around play. And even can affect some of the ways that like, I love the triathlon training stuff. It's awesome. And at some point, it does shift into work, kind of. And this, you really should be doing this. So if you're not, you're kind of failing. And then if you do it, you're like, well, good. At least I didn't fail today. And somewhere in the midst of doing it, it turns into play again. But there's like this buffer, I think. So there's two things I'm, I'm just throwing out there. One is the play is an interesting place to go, right? Because mm-hmm. I, given the opportunity, given a few moments in the day, yeah. I'll just exhale and stare at the wall. And some of the things that I do that do bring life somehow like fall into these should be doing kind of categories rather than love to be doing type categories. And I don't know how that happens. Yeah. And again, I I want to point out to our listeners, this is a group of people that take pretty good care of their souls. I mean, we have a culture that we try and disciple people in of your heart matters. It's the wellspring of life, you know, and Take care of it. Establish rhythms for your life. Do those things. And even as a culture at Ransomed Heart, we have a very intentional. So if we're out on mission, everybody gets time off afterwards. We don't expect everybody to show up Monday morning again. It's like rest, recover, replenish. You know, we want to live a healthy lifestyle. But putting play into your strategic thinking, not there. John, there's a quote I came across just today, this morning, and it's by a guy named John Wanamaker. I have no idea who he is, but listen to his words. People who cannot find time for recreation are obliged sooner or later to find time for illness. And I think whether he sees it that way or not, that's a heart story. Like if we don't find time, Sam, to do what you're, you know, not to watch the video or to find something momentary pleasurable, but not play, ultimately, we are going to find time. It's just going to be time with a massive recovery that we've got to give ourselves. It does seem that unless you are allowing some, I think of the word relief for the thing you're describing, Sam, but that one can go both directions too. But unless there's some regular strengthening and release for your soul in the place of play, then you actually end up carrying wounds that could have been healed simply through having some time for them to surface. The other thing I think of in this conversation is that the reality that Jesus is actually very playful Hmm. and that if you are not intentionally engaging play, then you are missing part of the personality of God. And anytime you're doing that, there are whole pieces in your life with God that would be supporting the whole, that would be supporting your calling, supporting your relationships, simply because you had such deep union with God. Hmm. And if you are not engaging any one of those I just know what I miss when I refuse to enter into the place of Jesus that is his playfulness for a long time. So I was reading Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem as Kingfishers Catch Fire. He's talking about nature and, and how you see the playfulness of God in creation. Kingfishers are these beautiful types of birds. As kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same. 
crying out, what I do is me, for that I came. And then this lovely line, Christ plays in 10,000 places. Mm. Mm. When I first heard that line, it really disrupted me. I'm like, what? Christ plays in 10,000 places? No, he doesn't. He's about more serious stuff than that. He's bringing the kingdom and rescuing people and shutting down evil. And Christ plays in 10,000 places. It took that much what felt like exaggeration to me to get my attention Mm. and go, oh my gosh, right, the playfulness of God. And so to your point, Blaine, like how much of our life and our life with God we actually never experience because we don't recognize his playfulness in a moment, in an invitation, in an opportunity. Yeah, play to me speaks of a certain condition of the, of the person playing, right? Like if I think of the hierarchy of needs, this person isn't needing triage, they're not needing food, they're not like desperate, which is often what I feel like my kind of small saves in the day can be. If it's just a few moments of breathing or staring at the wall, that's a lot more like triage. Whereas yes. play has this abandon to it. It has a presence to it. It has a, like a knowing that something is going to be well and the world can keep on spinning for however long. And it does affect others. Like I loved the the effect that bringing spike ball into the outpost had because all of a sudden people are poking their heads in and they're initiating games and there's just a whole nother way of interacting and like it's beautiful and it speaks to a certain like level of health and level of way of handling your life that sort of the the triage it's it's not just you need to take time to recharge and recover play is like intentional and somewhat aggressive in the world of life and feels defiant it does john you're mentioning creation Now, when I hear about creation, most of the time when it's talked about in church or in religious settings, God worked for six days and then had to rest. You know, he had six days of creation, but the creation was actually like, I think that was one of God's most playful, joyous, beautiful things. And we've turned that story into him working hard and then being exhausted somehow and resting on the seventh day when, to me, that's just the beauty of creation. And recreation i mean we're recreating we're creating something new in us when we're in a state of recreation and i think we just miss that i miss that so often okay speaking of the playfulness of god so like right now in the studio at this moment we have what is that a wasp a june bug oh it, no it's something with a stinger it is not as innocuous as a june bug <laughs> this thing is flying around above us in here and it's distracting everyone and i I love the playful interruption of God. He's like, you're even getting uptight about a podcast on play. Like, chill, relax. Okay, so I'm sitting with this beautiful couple, friends of Ransomed Heart, deeply moved by the message, and that carried them overseas to fight human trafficking. And they've been, like, literally in the fight for three years. And we were just chatting. It was just a conversation, kind of catching up. And But the comment they made was we used to have a lot of playfulness in our marriage. We got to get that back. And just simple things. They rode bikes together. They like riding bicycles. And like, man, it's been a long time since we've done that. And this isn't meant to be a shaming podcast. This isn't meant to be, okay, now let's add some guilt to your life. It's all of us have been ripped off. Like we just want to point out the hijack and go, man, play got stolen. And we want to get back. Em and I love playing cribbage and actually various games, but we realized very quickly that the level of opposition to the joy that's available in play and to the connection that's available in play was so significant. We actually had to have to stop before we start any game and pray over the space. Because what we're after is connection with one another is laughter. What we're after is this kind of communal bond that happens in the space of fun, in the space of relief, and that even when we did have time to break out a deck of cards, more often than not, it was frustration and, you know, it goes really poorly for one team. And the message that's coming on is just that classic thing of, it's just so not worth it. You know, you go to drag your bike out of the garage and both tires are flat, the trail is muddy. And I think I'm just surprised by the level of opposition 
but then finally letting the level of opposition tell me how important the activity was Mm -hmm. and that simply stopping before we do something because we want playfulness in our marriage to pray over the space and to consecrate it and to bind thievery has been massive. It has also it's made uh, our cribbage games far more competitive because I usually don't just get bad hands, though Emily is an excellent cribbage player. <laughs> wow. I don't think it actually does have a stinger. We found the bug because Blaine like, just literally up, jumped Blaine's out of his leg. chair. A seizure. No, it's not. It's not. It looks like a hornet. Somebody Wikipedia this for us. It has a hornet butt and a regular bug body, and we're choosing to let it live. <laughs> okay, so there you have it. Live report <laughs> <coughs> here from the Serengeti, the wildlife of ransomed heart. I think what we want to do is just put out there the idea of recover play. Recover play. And one of its greatest, greatest, greatest gifts is lightheartedness. So that's a quick test. Like, you know, yeah, youth sports. Oh, man. All the lightheartedness has been ripped out of that by the intensity of the last couple decades. And, you know, people thinking this is going to shape their child's future and get them a college scholarship and just, you know, it's just madness. So lightheartedness. Like, does it have lightheartedness? It's, you know, it's got to have that ingredient in all that that does for you. So impromptu around the table, what is the play you would love to recover? Susie and I have been kind of waging guerrilla war with play because uh, there's some part of me that sighs at the, like another battle to fight. If I'm honest, like really, I really, and so what we've been doing is in the moment, like we, we loved dancing. That's how we met. And so we'll put on some music in the house and one of us, the other of us, we'll just start goofily dancing in the kitchen and the other person will choose to join in. And we kind of end up doing a little show for our, little, our daughter in the bouncy chair who just loves the goofiness. And to me, that's almost, it's spontaneous, it's quick, it's lighthearted. And there's a playfulness to the marriage that it then invites of just, we can be goofy again and 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 enjoy each other this way. It's something, stories that I heard about Craig the same way that people would come over and he and Lori would be out in the deck dancing. And yeah. Like, I, I I love the joie de vivre that that sort of symbolizes for me. Yeah. Oh, I want to set a low bar here. Yeah, so dancing right? in the kitchen is my answer. Because the spike ball thing, for what it's done for the team, we're, game, we're talking about a little plastic ring with a net on it and a ball. I mean, it's it's not much. And you can get out there and, and play a game in 15 minutes and... It's brought so much joy because of the spontaneity, you know. It isn't, let's go run a marathon together. For us as a family, really cool thing. In our neighborhood, you can't have a basketball goal attached to the home, or you can't have a permanent one out in your yard. So for years, we just gave up on that, even though all our kids love to just shoot hoops and and play horse and just enjoy. And so we just bought a few weeks ago when you can wheel in and out of the garage, lift, you know, raise it to the full height. And we're out there, all five as a family, laughing and playing. And and we had let something stand in the way because it felt like too much work to take it in and out every day and realize, this is a blast. Or why did we not do that early on? And then personally, I've always wanted to play the guitar. And I've never played the guitar. Now, I don't, I don't have high aspirations of joining a band or anything like that. I just want to play it. And so I've had a guitar that Kelly gave me for a birthday for five or six years. And it sat in our family room, propped up against the wall. So I see it every day. And my desire is, like before the end of this year, to just start learning how to play something simple, just to just to engage with music in a way that I think would be a blast. No pressure, low bar. Man, I know you're not aspiring to join a band, but if Sam learned the drums and Dad picked up the <laughs> bass, we'd be <laughs> most of the way there. I'll whistle the tune. For M and I... Right when we got married, I had already loved road biking, and I bought um, a great, you know, entry-level road bike, and just so many fun evenings riding up the hill to the park, like a mile, and then walking around. And recently, Ailish has grown big enough that we can put her in a bike chariot, which I scored on Craigslist recently. We've only done it one time, and right now, 
it's kind of the it's it's fall, it's the last good weather. And I think and we've both been looking to, man, there's great bike lanes right outside. And it doesn't have and the park is a mile off. And so we've been looking to, man, can we just recover like the simple bike ride together with her daughter in the chariot? Admittedly, she doesn't love it yet, which kind of goes against this plan, uh, but you guys can all pray for me. He's um, serenaded by her screaming behind you the whole <laughs> time. <Yeah>, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I know it's coming around the table, and I'm quickly going through the files to come up with some inspiring thing to share. I don't know. I don't know. Like, between Stacy and me, like, where, like where we could recover play. And that is, I just need to be honest about that and just let that be rather than fake it I don't know. Like, I want it. I want to recover playfulness and lightheartedness and just not have life always being epic. You know, some people need to get a little bit more epic in their life. I actually need to get some of the epic out of my life. (laughs) And I was just struck by most of my hobbies are fairly epic, too. So, yeah, play. We thought we'd just throw that out there for you, friends, because Spike Ball has been bringing this team a ton of joy and playfulness, and it doesn't take much. It's, hey, you want to go outside? And boom, joy, laughter, the audio track that you heard at the beginning. You've been listening to the Ransom Tart Podcast, John Blaine, Sam Eldridge, Alan Arnold, and uh, thanks for listening in. Thanks for listening in.